When we think of Egyptian temples, we tend to picture something like this. The distinctive shaped pylons, the towering blocks of white stone. But this is a new kingdom image. In the old kingdom, temples were humbler and made of mud brick. After all, that's what the palaces of the king were made from. This is a sun temple. Perhaps half a dozen or so of these were ever built, and only two ruins have been found. They are stone buildings on an impressive scale, but they're not tombs. These are temples, as far as Egyptologists have been able to discern, to the living king as a god on earth. Since the Third Dynasty, the idea of the king as the son of Ra had been gaining traction, but this idea entered a new phase in the Fifth Dynasty. The first three kings of that dynasty, Usakaf, Sahure, and Kakai, were said in legend to have been triplets, prophesied biological children of the sun god Ra and a mortal woman called Redejet. Well, as things turned out, these kings weren't triplets. Sahure and Kakai might have been siblings, either the children or grandchildren of Usakaf, but it's actually unclear. Redejet herself remained confined to fiction. But the legend held that these sun kings were literal demigods. These were the sons of Ra, not by adoption as the kings of the third and fourth dynasties had been, but by blood. As divinities themselves, they became the focus and perhaps even object of worship. The temples they built for themselves sadly have not survived to the modern day. The ruins we have are so incomplete that this iconic form is really only hypothetical. And this ambiguity doesn't just apply to the modern day. By the time of the 18th dynasty, the ruined sun temples were thought to be ruined pyramids, a mistake that was repeated in the 19th century CE by Lepsius, the German archaeologist who discovered the ruins of one of them. The only reason we now suspect otherwise is we've read what inscriptions about them we've been able to recover. It is significant that these are not tombs or mortuary temples. They might be the first royally commissioned stone structures in Egypt that had nothing to do with the dead or the afterlife. Of the two ruins discovered, one is most complete, that being Nehenre, the Fortress of Ra, built in the reign of Usakaf, the founder of the dynasty. The obelisk mounted on a mastaba, the most distinctive part of the temple, is a solid structure with no internal space. The granite obelisk may actually have been added after Usakaf's reign. Either way, the altar, the functional part of the temple, was outside of this structure, which was unusual for Egyptian temples. It's also worth noting that temples to living gods were not generally akin to modern day churches, but more like modern day palaces. They were literally the homes of the gods. This is an interesting thing to remember when looking at the Sun Temple, which was not a residence for the king, the man ostensibly being worshipped here. The Sun Temple had three distinct components. Close to the Nile was a smaller valley temple, a columned enclosure where offerings could be received. Then, as was customary in religious complexes at the time, a long causeway led out of the river valley and up to drier ground where the main temple was located. In Nechenre's case, it was built upon a low hill just at the border of the desert. I should note that we call them sun temples to distinguish their unique design and purpose from the temples of both earlier and later periods, but we have yet to discover a special term for them used by the Egyptians. After all, these buildings certainly would have inspired religious awe, but consider that in English both this and this can be called a church without alarming anyone, even though architecturally the two are very different and the latter represents considerably more advanced building techniques. The impact of the sun temples is hard to gauge. As a structural form, they stopped being built before the end of the dynasty that innovated them, and their like would not be seen until Akhenaten's time towards the end of the 18th dynasty. As part of a wider expansion of Ra as a national deity, however, they seem to have done the trick. By the end of the 5th dynasty, Ra was here to stay, not only as a nationwide god, but a royal god. Even in later times, when gods such as Montu and Amun would have their turns as supreme being, they were merged with Ra, considered in some cases to be aspects of Ra. And even when the kings of Egypt were seen as merely men, they were still called the sons of Ra, whether they were Egyptian or not. Thanks for watching, liking, subscribing, all those things that help the channel grow. As a tiny channel, every like and comment and view helps more people get to see my videos, so it really does make a huge difference to me, and I really am very grateful. Thanks as well to my backers on Patreon, whose generosity allows me not only to intake nutrients, but to buy more Egyptology books. Mmm. Delicious.
delicious. Until next time, my fellow armchair Egyptologists, life, prosperity, and health to you all. Thanks for watching. Head over to my channel for more, or click here to see what the YouTube demons think you should watch next. I hope you'll consider subscribing. If you'd like to support and collaborate on the channel with me, go to patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You can also join my Discord community, there's an invite link in the description.